On today's episode, we're going to talk about some players who maybe they're having a quiet offseason, but we still think that they can make a big impact. And it's early rankings time. We're talking about the wide receivers. Make sure you subscribe to this channel, like the episode, leave us a comment, and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Uh, welcome, man. Well, welcome, man. Welcome, man. Were you were you welcoming Auntie Anne? Welcome into the show. Tuesday, April nineteenth, the fantasy footballers. Mike Wright is here. Yep. I'm Andy Holloway, and we are joined from social, the, from the stat distanced. house. From Jason. Uh, we're joined by Jason Moore. That's Jason right. is Jason's with us. Welcome in, Jason. I'm happy to be back, even though it's virtual. Didn't do his hair. <laughs> no, nah, didn't do my hair. Not, no. not going to do that for you guys. A little raspy. They're, You're sounding raspy. <clears throat> yeah, it's almost like I had, you know, I don't know. Some kind of some kind of sickness. Yeah, but we're excited you're feeling better and you're back on the show and you're here for a wide receiver rankings episode and I'm sure you have incredible insights or things of that nature for us today. Oh, fever dream conversations about these wide receivers forthcoming. Yeah, your dreams are generally um, very accurate, right? <laughs> yes, usually when I dream Joseph something, over here. it's gonna it's gonna come true. So uh, what, uh, Jason, if you could say like, this is the show that was the best watch of my quarantine or the one I watched the most, like wh what's, what was the go-to show? Uh, it would have been the new Vikings, Vikings Valhalla. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You Not are a sponsor, but you are more of a, um, like of all the people I know that would go stir crazy the fastest, you're. At the top of that list, how, how's it been? Have you survived? I'm going insane. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going insane. I am. Uh, I I'm a, a different person now already. <laughs> you're you're an introvert now. I you know what it's an like. Introvert? I know what it's like to be locked in jail. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah you're with Netflix in jail. <laughs> and a computer. Do you get uh, Netflix in jail? I doubt well, you, it. Do, I do in my jail. <laughs> In a real luxurious bed. All right. Yeah. Well, we got the crew back. This is terrible. Um, nobody else is sick. We're we're doing okay, right? This is we're it, back. We're back, baby. We're back in business. Uh, we have early top ten wide receiver rankings on today's show. Some NFL news that we haven't covered yet. A reminder: UltimateDraftKit.com. If you want to get instant access to the Dynasty Pass, we'll have another update after the NFL draft here in a couple weeks. Because it's gonna be it's next week yeah so, it's go time uh very exciting ultimate draftkit.com to check that out the community has joined the foot.com quick question of the day i'll toss it to jason first which player had the quietest off season so far who is somebody fantasy managers might be forgetting about well i i thought this one made a lot of sense because when we were putting our rankings together for wide receivers I'm like for I just I'm completely forgetting about Michael Thomas. Like who who is who is Michael Thomas? Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he's not. I th I don't think he was in my top thirty. But then that's insane. Um, you know I I I take a step back and go. Well, he is still a good wide receiver. And I know they lost Drew Brees. They're going to have you know a, a coming off of injury Winston. But he's going to have a target market share that will be up there with you know, the best wide receivers in the league just because they don't really have many other options. I expect them to grab a uh, rookie wide receiver, probably a first round rookie wide receiver, but still he should have a lot of volume. You haven't heard much of anything from him. He should be fine and healthy recovery wise. I know he's a little bit older, but it's like, I don't know. He's just kind of disappeared from fantasy football for so long that mentally he's not He's not in conversations. He's not someone we talk about or consider or want to draft. But in the end, I think he's probably going to be a pretty valuable piece in fantasy football in 2022. I think there's a lot of fantasy players, myself included, who just don't 
they're not up for that headache this year. <laughs> they're not up for the adventure. Maybe they don't feel like, like sometimes the headache can be worth it if it's Christian McCaffrey headache, right? It's the headache that comes with maybe you're the number one overall running back. And it's harder for me with Michael Thomas because what is the, what is the best case scenario for accepting the burden of that decision? I think that is the concern. I think it'd be me. a wide wide receiver ten, you know, so someone that's right, you know, a wide receiver one, uh, even top ten, but not a uh, not a star. He's not going to be a fifteen touchdown, probably not even a ten touchdown guy with Winston there. So I, I think that's kind of his high volume, um, his way to a low end wide receiver one. That's his ceiling. And it was, he's twenty nine. We haven't seen Michael Thomas do anything since two thousand nineteen. I mean, you had the 2020 season which was very shortened because of injury but even in that time you know he was he was okay statistically for for a six game run but wide receiver 16 was his highest finish in that time period it's it's just been so it's on top of him missing last year it's just been so long since we've had really relevant number one Michael Thomas I went with another 29 year old wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins Arizona, it's not been a pretty offseason for Arizona, and we will get into more of that in the news. But DeAndre Hopkins is was on pace for 15 touchdowns with Kyler Murray last year before the injury. But you get the combination of um, what I'll call elite fatigue. Sometimes certain players play at a certain level for a long enough time uh, the, people grow tired of it and they want to move on um, to somebody else, somebody younger. He's 29, same age as Devontae Adams, who's making a transition to a new team. But Hopkins didn't end the year playing, so that was step one. The Cardinals ended the year in disaster, step two. The offseason's been filled with nothing but losing pieces and or Kyler Murray drama. And so I think Hopkins is left in this place where – I mean, he's being drafted behind uh, uh, Deontay Johnson in drafts. What? He's what? being yeah. What? He's being ranked behind Deontay Johnson no, in consensus ranking. No, go go away. So there is this place where Hopkins is just ignored, and so I felt like he fit the bill pretty good for this question. All right, I want to bring up someone who he got in the headlines, but it was. I think it was dismissed quicker than it should. Like it, it deserved some. Uh, it deserved its time. Like the community didn't gauge it properly. Nice. I like what you did there. <laughs> I want to, Russell Gage, who is coming hot off of signing his uh, new contract with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, three year, thirty million, uh, with twenty guaranteed. So, like, this isn't just a chump change contract. The whole the gang is all back. Tom Brady is going to be the quarterback from week seven on, which is after the bye week for uh, the Atlanta Falcons. Russell Gage was the wide receiver eighteen in total points in that time stretch. He was he had more points per game than C D Lamb. Than than C D Lamb, people, the guy who like we are projecting and drafting as a top ten wide receiver. Russell Gage here, who's going to be playing with Tom Brady, is just a complete afterthought. And on top of that, Chris Godwin, when's he going to be ready to go? Like you could be, you could be six weeks in before you really see Chris Godwin. Like the pup is an option for him as we move forward. Russell Gage had as many top twelve weeks on the season as Stephon Diggs. Like Russell Gage is a much better wide receiver than I believe he is given credit for publicly and by the fantasy community. He was in a really, really bad spot. Last year, I'm not saying Gage is a is a true number one wide receiver, but he is a good complementary wide receiver who I think can uh, have quite a few spike weeks throughout the season. There was a report of at least one Russell Gage Tampa Bay jersey being sold from the team shop, <laughs> and we do know who bought it. Well, Mom, Mama Gage. Yeah, no, it was Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, I told you, Mike, about an hour ago. I. I was leaning towards, and I haven't said Ooh. it yet, but leaning towards the Tom Brady bust call Fate, for fading. this year, who was a my guy for last year. But part of it does have to do with 
the situation with Chris Godwin. Gage may be able to fill in a little bit, but he's certainly not Chris Godwin. And so I wonder, without Bruce Arians, I know they have stability elsewhere. should be very interesting. Yeah, I, and I don't Gage think will they, have an opportunity. Yeah, he will. I don't think they brought him in to be a Chris Godwin replacement. I think he's brought in to be an Antonio Brown replacement. When they had all right. three wide receivers – uh, going at the same time, they that's when they were humming like nobody's business. And I think that, you know, uh, the antics of Antonio Brown taking him off the field, they said, hey, let's go get a capable third wide receiver. So I, I don't I don't know that he'll I, – I, I have a hard time seeing a lot of fantasy relevance for Gage, but I I think he's going to help Tom Brady. I, I'm pretty surprised by your uh, bearish Tom Brady. Well, I mean, it, it, it really comes down to – missing two thirds of what you had that made you great you know no Antonio Brown no Chris Godwin and no Bruce Arians so and Gronk is TBD I, I expect him to be back but, and no Gronk but there is yeah. a chance that he's not back and he said he's not uh ready to commit to football so there's yeah there's three of your four options and he is getting older and it will happen at some point in time if he keeps saying yes to playing so um yeah I'm, I'm leaning that way I don't know Feels like I turned my back on my guy, but, but that's how that's how you got to do it in fantasy. Yep. News and notes from around the league. In a mesmerizing turn of events, the kind that I would have paid a lot of money to have happened. Sammy Watkins has signed a one-year deal with the Green Bay Packers worth up to $4 million, meaning, of course, <laughs> of course, that the Lizard King and the Lizard King have combined forces. Oh, the Lizard people. They're the taking over. <laughs> the Lizard folks <laughs> in Green Bay. The Lizards can make up for Devontae Adams' absence, right? Uh, last time Watkins was the top 36 fantasy wide receiver is 2015. Whew. And this podcast was being recorded. <laughs> In what equated to a small bedroom. So we'll see. Can the cold blooded king, can he thrive up in the cold? Not that it will matter because more pieces will be added, but just for the fun of it, because I did ask this to our Packer fan here, Al Borland. If you had to pick between Watkins or Lazard, who do you pick? I'd go Lazard. Oh, Lazard for sure. I mean, it's easy. To, yeah, you, you've got to gain the trust of Aaron Rodgers. It usually takes years for wide receivers to really get that, and Lazard has it. The Lizard does not, and I doubt he ever gets it. A.J. Brown, Debo Samuel, set to skip voluntary workouts. They want contracts. Wide receivers getting paid this offseason. They want some of the money. Terry McLaurin's also in that camp, but uh, will report, according to The Athletic. Mm. All three were draft selections in 2019, final year of their rookie deal. Trade McLaurin, you cowards. <laughs> so what do you think is going to happen in these situations? I think they're all going to get paid. Yeah, I would. that's what I would put the, the bet on. I'd parlay it. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, big news, guys. I, um, we <laughs> I've got a new uh, kind of like an audio bed that I'm going to use when we talk about the Cardinals oh. offseason because I have some news to report. And the Arizona Cardinals – they're bringing back A.J. Green <laughs> on a one-year deal worth $3 million. Turns 34 in July. Oh, yeah. Oh, when you got a chance to get future Hall of Famer A.J. Green back in the fold, you got to take it. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Thoughts, Jason, on this uh, incredible offseason for the Cardinals? Yeah, they they weren't able to get Andre Johnson, and so they were like, <laughs> "Oh man, we'll just bring back AJ Green." Oh gosh. <sighs> cool, 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 cool. So yeah, AJ Green back to Arizona. No Christian Kirk. So they'll probably draft a wide receiver in the first round. There's oh. rumors about Jahan Dotson. <clears throat> yeah, let's let's get another sub 180 pound guy uh, at wide receiver. Misuse him. Uh, let's just keep doing this every year. I I love the the concept. <laughs> Jason, a big Cardinal fan. <laughs> uh, Tom Pelissero reporting that uh, we also haven't made a contract offer to Kyler Murray. So as Jason pointed out the other day, not only 
do we not have have we not signed anybody in Arizona but we also haven't signed our quarterback so we didn't spend any of the money anywhere it's actually in a shoebox just just wait man any day now so uh, Tom Pelissero from the NFL Network said that Murray is due 5.5 million and it would be a surprise if he plays on that deal we're not doing that are we get it uh... I don't know I don't know what we're doing <laughs> uh, Kyle, you're not like, a. My God, it's Steve Kimes music. Uh, Kyle, you're not a. <laughs> you're not a native to Arizona. Do you have any kind of like independent thoughts on the Cardinals off season? Is it is it better than we are are treating it? They're stuck in the worst possible place you could do for building a franchise. Which is what? In the middle, nobody cares. Eight and nine. <laughs> all right uh i think that is all the news we have oh, for man. today they're gonna be so goodish <laughs> they're gonna be so goodish oh cool. okay let's talk about expectations nice Go and Suns. low that's what we've prepared ourselves yeah. for um okay let's take a quick break then we'll come back with the wide receivers Well, we're going to jump into the wide receiver rankings here momentarily. Um, I, I'm curious if an Arizona Cardinal makes the list. Let's find out. Wide receivers. All right. We just did two running back rankings episodes, our early running back rankings. Last week, you can go back and listen to them. And if you want even uh, and even be bigger, an even bigger <laughs> – even bigger, <laughs> bigger deep dive. You can go back to the truth episodes from earlier in the off season as we broke down the reality for a lot of these players based on their fantasy finish last year. So we're looking at our half PPR rankings, early consensus rankings. No surprise, Cooper Cup at the tippy top of the list. Why? Because he can't. He he came. Pretty close to one of the best wide receiver seasons in history. Yeah. 145 receptions, 1,947 yards, 16 touchdowns, 191 targets. And this was greatness. 14 weeks last year as a top 12 wide receiver. The fourth wide receiver ever to win the Triple Crown, which is receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns. His 21.6 fantasy points per game was second all-time to 1995 Jerry Rice, who was just above. So Matthew Stafford was a good thing for Cooper Cup. Yep. And we already we already knew that Cooper Cup was a good player. Like it's it, it wasn't his first rodeo as being an elite fantasy wide receiver. Just two years ago, he was wide receiver four uh, on the season. And that was 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns. That was back in the Jared Goff days. Had the unfortunate fall off the, the following season. But that was kind of the season that led to McVay and company saying, we have to make a change. And they made the really bold decision of you have an average quarterback. And they went out and they got a quarterback that they thought was great. It clearly worked out for the team as they already have a Super Bowl and everyone's coming back uh, to run it back for – for uh, a possible back-to-back -back Super Bowl championship. But Cooper Cup, we don't – putting him at one – I'll throw it, I'll throw this to Jason. Cooper Cup at one, are you fully expecting that he's the number one overall wide receiver, or is it just like what else is in your process of keeping him at number one? Yeah, he's, he's so far and away my number one wide receiver. I'm a little sad that Devontae Adams and Tyree Kill left their great situations because – now it's easy to make Cooper Cup the number one, but he should have been no matter what. Um, whether or not I expect him to be the wide receiver one this year is, you know, it's kind of irrelevant, right? Because you have a bunch of wide receivers who are all going to be great. They're all going to be vying for that spot. If if Jamar Chase is the number one wide receiver, that that's fine. But when you're looking at probabilities and, you know, Look at what Calvin Johnson did with Matthew Stafford year after year after year. When he had his monster year, the following season he lost 500 yards 
which put him at 1,400 yards. Like, right. that's – I mean, if if Cooper Cup has a much, much worse season, he could still finish as the wide receiver one. So when you're just looking at probabilities, what he – has been able to do uh, you know and it's not like it was a secret by the halfway point in the season of where Stafford wanted to go and defenses were trying to do something about Cooper Cup um you, I think that it's a, a it's an unstoppable pairing nothing makes me believe it's gonna I mean it, I I don't think he's going to have you know near 2,000 yards and uh, have the same kind of repeated season, but I I definitely think he has the highest odds of being the wide receiver one next year. That's what you're really looking for when you talk about where uh, wide receivers drafted. Antonio Brown was drafted as the wide receiver one, so first off the board, three consecutive seasons, 2016, 17, and 18, finished at 2-2-5. Two, two, and five. Yeah, you, so Expectations were pretty much met. Outside of injury, the percentage chance that he finishes as a top five wide receiver in 2022 have to be the highest of all the options. And so that's why he slots in at wide receiver one. When you look at what types of things could change, you could certainly see 16 touchdowns uh, go down. You could see a, a running game with Cam Akers return that is slightly more proficient, even in the red zone. You could see Allen Robinson's involvement in certain situations, uh, impact Cooper Cup, but the likelihood is he will be elite once again. Yeah, I think the it's in, will be interesting to see. You know, this team with a full season without Robert Woods, he tore his ACL right before Week Ten. So can can Allen Robinson do enough uh, that Cooper Cup can still continue to thrive? Number two is Justin Jefferson. Jason and I have him at two. Mike has him at three. 167 targets, 108 receptions, 1,616 yards, 10 touchdowns. Just an elite wide receiver at the NFL level. He's so good. Finished at wide receiver four. Still just 23 years old and has the most receiving yards ever for a wide receiver in the first two years of the NFL. So that passed Odell Beckham Jr.'s first two years by 261 yards, most air yards in the NFL, which means that, uh, you know, the, the distance between where the ball was thrown and where right. he catches it. And so uh, he's just been dominant. And so he's the go-to option in Minnesota. Jason, any reason to doubt Justin Jefferson? No, none, none whatsoever. You've got Kevin O'Connell, the new head coach, that's coming over from uh, the Rams. So maybe this is the new Cooper Cup. Uh, you know, I, I, I think Stafford is, uh, better than cousins, but we've already seen, I mean, the connection is there. Uh, the, the offense is pretty much the same as it's been the last two years. He's coming in. It's kind of crazy to think like he's coming into year three and you don't think of a player who's done what he's done as still like maybe getting better still figuring out, you know, how to be a better wide receiver, but he certainly is. So, uh, you know, I, Justin Jefferson is, you know, when you talk Chase and Justin Jefferson, there's a great argument to be had of ceiling versus floor. I think that Chase's ceiling is probably higher than Justin Jefferson, but Justin Jefferson feels as safe as anyone not named Cooper Cup. Uh, that's why I've got him as, at number two. I just can't imagine him not having a top 10 season. Jamar Chase at number three. Mike has him at two. Jason and I at three. He's 22 years old last year. 13 touchdowns. Finishes the wide receiver five, 81 for 14.55. I will say the... <laughs> you, you, okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, the second half of the year, you know, you look at the consistency during that time of the year, and you can go back to the truth episodes to talk about it, but you did have him disappear. Mm -hmm. Something When you talk about preference of the type of wide receiver, that's why I lean Justin Jefferson to Jamar Chase. Chase is very capable of giving you 203 on any given week. Uh, we saw the Kansas City Chiefs forget to defend him for a game, and he just uh, destroyed them. But only three games inside the top 24 uh, from week seven. I mean, from week seven on, three games in the top 24, that's a little shocking. But obviously still developing 
and had the second most fantasy points by a rookie wide receiver, only behind Randy Moss's 1998 season. Ooh. So splash plays is the name of the game, Mike. You'd take Jamar over Jefferson. Why did I mean, you go that route? Uh, it's, why do you hate Jefferson and why do you love Chase? <laughs> Please tell me. It's I mean that this is the it's just a razor thin margin here between those two wide receivers, and it was for me a bet on Jamar Chase heading into his second year. Age is not a factor between these two guys, but for Chase to put up fourteen hundred and thirteen as a rookie with T Higgins, uh who is a good wide receiver across from him, uh, across from him. That's just, that's such an outrageous level of production for a rookie that I think that the consistency will level up the next year. And it's just, there aren't, there are so few wide receivers that can actually re hit that line of, Oh, it, well, they hit a 200 yard game like that. That number is so unrealistic for wide receivers but that's like that's done when Jamar Chase does something like that it's the, the week is done the rest of your team can be garbage and you won a week Jason do you think he will become more consistent or will I, you get boom and bust uh I think he'll become more consistent you know he was just a rookie last year this this reminds me a lot of some of the questions that we were talking about last year with Stafford and Cup and McVeigh and being like are we going to look back and just say, man, we really should have seen this coming. Like, get McVay a good quarterback, and this whole offense is awesome. We were saying that before the season last year. This year, it's one of those like, oh, shouldn't we have seen Jamar Chase's clear wide receiver one season coming because he was only a rookie, and he put up 1,455 and 13 touchdowns. Joe Burrow's getting better, like, if they level up and allow him to really be the center of the team versus Mixon, uh, I mean, shouldn't Jamar Chase have the ability and opportunity to get nearer to 100 catches and 1,600 yards and 16 touchdowns? I mean, so it's 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 funny. The reason I prefer Jefferson over Chase is because the floor, we, we haven't seen as much, and he was more of an 80 reception, not a 100 reception guy. So you got to project next year in one of the two directions, and but I I could see Jamar Chase easily. I mean, you know, I I took my lumps because I did not think he was the otherworldly rookie prospect that most people did, and obviously I was an idiot. Um, <laughs> but watching enough NFL film, and you just can't once this guy has the ball in his hands, you can't always get there fast enough he just turns on the jets and then the game is over it's kind of like mike said he's gonna win you weeks and i think that when he, he fills in the other aspects of being an nfl wide receiver and and more possession based and that type of stuff you, you're not going to lose the breakaway monster play ability i i think he just gets the ball in his hands more this next year so i if if you wanted to take jamar chase as the number one wide receiver i don't think that's crazy Maybe the template is Jefferson. From year one to year two, added 20 receptions, 200 yards, and three touchdowns. So it can go up. Number four, Devontae Adams on our, consist, uh, our consensus wide receiver rankings. 29 years old. Jason and Mike have him at five. I have him at four. Was the wide receiver three last year on 169 targets. Consistency has been his game. He's averaged 11 targets, 93 rush, uh, receiving yards, and almost a touchdown every game for the last four years. And the big question mark for people is, yeah, you are now moving from Aaron Rodgers to Derek Carr, his buddy. And I think there's a lot of doubt. And I think that there are people that are going to get a steal with Devontae Adams if he ends up being able to d deliver on his new team. Uh, or there will be people that have made the right decision to to kind of move away from thinking of him in the same tier that he used to be. And the question is, what do you believe about Devontae Adams? And yeah, it's – well, he's elite. I mean, he's, you know, whatever, top three wide receiver in the NFL. The hardest part is the changing of teams. You got you have to like the, that him and Derek Carr, our friends, have already played together. So there is a natural chemistry that will, that will come back, I think, rather quickly. 
but we've seen wide receivers when they change teams a lot of times it doesn't work out we had uh matt desorbo one of our writers he looking into these things and wide receivers changing teams we've seen them on average score 21 percent fewer points in their first year with that team so it's yeah, no, I know that that was the bet that, like, I've made recently on, uh, you know, like Stephon Diggs going to the Bills. Could it? Re yeah, these change of teams got an inaccurate quarterback, and then boom, Stephon Diggs was a league-winning wide receiver. Hopkins, DeAndre Hop Hopkins, yeah. DeAndre Hopkins went from his situation in Houston, where he was seeing th a guaranteed thirty-plus percent of the targets, goes to Arizona. Will he really see that target share and? Yep, he did, and Hopkins was fantastic. So we've – while, you know, on average the wide receiver's numbers goes down, this is simply a bet on Devontae Adams himself being a top three wide receiver and will command 30-plus percent of Derek Carr's targets. Now, his targets aren't the same as Rodgers' targets, but enough that we've got him still ranked in our top five. The crazy thing about Adams is that you have an offense in Las Vegas that was 29th in terms of wide receiver target percentage last year, and he's going to come in there. Now, they were seventh in total pass attempts, like percentage of uh, – in their highest percentage of pass versus run. So they were willing to throw the football, just not to any wide receivers. Well, yeah, got the Walrus and Josh Jacobs got a bunch of targets. So, uh, Jason, do you uh, foresee any troubles for Devontae Adams in Las Vegas? Yeah, yeah, I do. I I think that um, he's still going to be great. He's my you know uh, what is he my wide receiver five. I I thought he would be lower in my rankings, but the reality is he is phenomenal. He is going to be the clear one here. Um, but you look at last year where he had 169 targets, and you think, okay, well, who else was he really dividing targets with? The next highest target getter from the Packers was a running back there was nobody else to throw the ball to whereas Darren Waller you know he was on a 140 plus target pace last year he had over 140 targets the year prior and Hunter Renfro is clearly a possession guy so I do think the targets come down a little bit um, and the touchdowns come down so I don't think he's going to be that number one fantasy wide receiver in the league uh, the way that he's been over the last several years with Aaron Rodgers and the situation he found himself in. You're going to have fewer touchdowns, fewer targets, but he's still great, and he's going to be you know, a, the wide receiver five type. I'm going to surface a question now because we've gone through four names, and it's pretty much can they finish at one. Adam still meets that for I think, me. I think, I think Adams still can, can still yeah. finish at one, and part of that comes from Josh McDaniels being the new head coach. The fact that, um, you know, there's a chance that Derek Carr just comes out and throws it to his guy over and over and over again. Because that is something we've seen Carr willing to do, right? He's been willing yeah. to force the ball, it just was to Darren Waller. Waller. And, and so. And back in the Michael Crabtree days. So do we all think Adams can? I do. I think he can, yeah. Okay. Diggs at five. Stephon Diggs, 28 years old, just got paid again. Last year was a little bit strange. strange. Yeah, uh, he had ten touchdowns, one hundred and three for twelve, twenty-five, and ten. And there's really nothing to be upset about with that final line. Finished as the wide receiver seven. Didn't win you a lot of weeks. In fact, he only had four games where he ended up inside the top ten on a weekly finish. And so, I think he's about as safe as they get, though. And I think Diggs may be one of those players that you can get a a steal on. Um, you guys do have him at four, so you both have him ahead of Adam, so you feel very comfortable there. Yeah, it's, yeah I, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I, I think Diggs is in such a good situation. Um, the first half of last year, Emmanuel Sanders had something left to give and really kind of had his games at the expense of Diggs. And then if you get rid of that first chunk, you know, those first five weeks, Emmanuel Sanders kind of disappeared, and that's when Diggs was pretty consistent the rest of the way. They just paid him a ton of money. They have lost Cole Beasley. They have lost Emmanuel Sanders. They are saying, like, th this is our one for the foreseeable future. I, I think the fact that people are weirdly disappointed in last year just because he didn't have any monster, you know, win-you-the-week type uh, regularity to, to his season last year, 
I think he's a discount right now. Like he should be someone you're trying to target in the dynasty leagues because he's a little bit older. People are disappointed with his last season, but he just got paid, and I, I think he's going to have a great year this year and the next year and the next year. Um, Can I give you a weird Stefan Diggs stat? Yeah. Oh, I've got a weird one too. So. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, as well. <laughs> I will get one last. Uh, he had only 118 of his 165 targets deemed catchable, which is incredible. That's 74th amongst wide receivers, which means that Hunter Renfro had the exact same amount of receptions as Diggs on 37 fewer targets. So I, you know, it, it's odd because Josh Allen was at an MVP level, but something didn't quite click on every one of those targets. And that something was the intermediate game. Because I went, I was trying to figure out what happened to Allen. You know, was was this deep ball drastically different uh, from this past year to two years ago and Stephon Diggs, and it really wasn't. And then I jumped into their uh, intermediate targets. So Stephon Diggs in 2020, so the big year, his first year with the Bills, 53 targets in the intermediate range, which is 10 to 19 yards. He caught 70 percent of those of those passes. So that's 37 receptions this past year, 47 targets, very similar. He caught 51% of those intermediate targets. So something was not clicking in that zone uh, where, I mean, Stefan Diggs can absolutely stretch the field, but he was just an absolute murderer uh, of moving the chains back two years ago when he was so dominant. So that, that, uh, that is just to me is like, that's just a weird, one year anomaly where right. I think that that number, maybe it's not 70%, but 51% of those targets in a range that should be easy receptions for Stephon Diggs. I think that that can come back up and I, his situation with Allen's so good. Debo Samuel comes uh, in uh, at number. Real, real, oh, do you have oh, a oh, you stat? Got a weird, you have yeah. a Diggs stat? Stephon Diggs only had one rushing yard last year. Oh man, that's weird. Yeah, super weird. That's so a weird stat, put, put, Jason. Put Good that, job, yeah, buddy. Just, just had one of them, so he okay. had, but he did have one. Um, All right, and that's Stephon Diggs, twenty twenty one. Man, deep diving. <laughs> what did he have in twenty twenty for rushing uh, yards? More, <laughs> more. <laughs> <laughs> no, you keep studying. Yeah, I'll let you know. All right, Debo comes in at number six. The man wants to get paid, though. Well, he wants to be a rich man. I still have him at five. Jason, Mike, you have him at seven. I mean, what can't you say? What hasn't been said, I guess, is what uh, last year for Debo was incredible. He led the NFL in yards per reception, yards per target, receiving yards uh, versus zone coverage. He's got a rushing floor that is just not something you see. 365 rushing yards, eight touchdowns on the ground, which is two more than he had as a receiver was the wide receiver too. And as a pure athlete could, it could be argued. He's the most entertaining player to watch at the wide receiver sure, position. That's fine. Versatile, yeah. right? He, he's so much fun to watch. He, hard, hard to tackle. Um, incredible in the open field behind the line of scrimmage everywhere. But there are, you know, negative storylines for him right now. You've got a worse quarterback coming in as far as throwing the ball has to be, right? I mean, there's no and, way. Yeah, until proven otherwise, you, you, a player who has not played, yeah, I would say they're a worse pass than the Jimmy Garoppolo. Trey right, Lance. so assuming that Trey Lance is the quarterback, there's a downgrade there. And then you look at how much of his rushing work was done with injury, while running back injuries factored in, and then they said, we're going to need Debo a lot more. Right. So if those two things change for the slight negative, then it, it, it gets scarier. You know, I'd rather have a wide receiver that's going to be like, I think he's going to have 170 targets. This is the first guy where it's like, you just need him to score a ton of touchdowns because you can't tackle him. And that's not how I like to rely on fantasy, you know, prospects. It's tough. It's really tough with Debo because you can swing the pendulum too far, right? You can... Um, take a little bit of the trust that should probably be given to Kyle Shanahan that he will find a way to involve him uh, regardless of the variables in play. And 
you know, the, the opportunities, right? Like the objective is to give Debo the ball as much as humanly possible. Sometimes it meant it all on the ground. Sometimes it was targets. You know, you combine them and he was at 180 opportunities. So I guess I do trust that they will find a way to do it, but it may be a bumpier road than we expect, and it may come a lot differently. Like I would bet everything that he doesn't have eight rushing touchdowns. And that's where the that's where my biggest problem comes in. Now, he had three rushing touchdowns as as a rookie, which is on 14 attempts, which is pretty interesting of maybe that was, you know, foreshadowing. His sophomore year was completely derailed to injuries. But there's just – I would not bet on the eight rushing touchdowns. Does that balance out with a few more receiving touchdowns? That's certainly possible. Uh, but for so much of his production to come through the rushing is uh, – it, it's, it's a scary proposition. This is the first wide receiver we've been at where it's like, can Debo finish number one? And he, the, where we've been saying, yeah, you, my answer for Debo would be, uh, yeah, kind of, maybe. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think number one is tough. And I don't think, I mean, we, did we ask that question with Diggs? I think Diggs can be the number one, yes. I do as well. I don't know if I think Diggs can be the number one. I, I think both of these guys have just, they're both top five, equal odds at top five, but I don't know if they can be number one. Uh, Debo, you know, in those games where he scored on the ground, it was still, you know, six opportunities, five opportunities. They can still put the ball in his hands around the goal line. Yeah, but um, I do think that there will be a few of those rushing opportunities vultured by rushing touchdowns from Trey Lance. That's that's yes. part of the problem. Yes. Is, no, that's a good point. You know, that they're, they're going to get creative rushing touchdowns because they have Shanahan. It's just, are they still Debo or are they Lance? So you're thinking they might, like, have Jimmy run over to the sideline and they'd put Lance in for those plays? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> they, did, they did it a handful of times. Uh, he's riskier. He's definitely riskier yeah. than the, the top five on the list. A.J. Brown comes in at seven, just 24 years old with a cool. ton of baggage, emotional baggage for fantasy players because of missed games, injuries, disappointments. You know, when he hits – you know, every one of his plays is one of those, oh, my gosh, that is a physical force in this league. That is a player that, you know, could I think he could finish as the number one overall wide receiver. I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility for A.J. Brown. But, you know, he, he's a big play guy. But you need him to be healthy. You need him to be on the field, and you need to be able to execute the uh, play-action pass game for a whole season to get the kind of return on investment. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I mean, certainly his injury history has been problematic in the NFL. When he's on the field, he's usually great. I think that it'll be helped by having Robert Woods on the field as well. Um, they got nothing from Julio Jones. Uh, presuming health of this team, which obviously Woods is coming back from his own injury. <laughs> Derrick Henry's coming back from an injury. But if they're healthy, A.J. Brown is a young, dominant wide receiver who I, I I like in all respects with with the exception of one, which is that he's not that super high volume. You know, he was, uh, you know, on pace for 137 targets, which is great. That's in on 17 games. That's a lot, but that's not the elite superstar, you know, where you're near 170 targets. So you've got to get bigger plays, more touchdowns, and that's going to, that's going to come with less consistency. And, and that's kind of where I think you start to see some of the tear breaks from the elite guys who you just know are getting 150 plus targets to the big play guys who are talented and you're just going to have to, you know, pair them with other consistent wide receivers. They, yeah, 24th in pass attempts for Tennessee, Mike. Did you have something to add? I'll say, but just where the, the hope that you can look at it for A.J. Brown is two years ago when he was the wide receiver 11 on the season. Remember back to the story. Like, he got hurt in week one, missed quite a few games, and was he was back after their bye week. So from week five through the rest of the season, he was the wide receiver three. He was the wide receiver five in points per game. So he, even with the, the, the red flags of, of the volume, 
he was still absolutely dominant for a really long stretch of the season. It, but but I'm with you guys of like it's emotionally so hard to invest yet again in AJ Brown being my number one wide receiver because like where he's being drafted, you know, you're gonna have to either have you'll have an RB one and AJ Brown or he's your wide receiver too. He's in best ball right now. He's going as the wide receiver eight in the middle of the second. It's tough because he's the kind of receiver you could force the ball to and be fine with. Like the, re right. the quarterback could be fine with that, right? He's he's got that ability where if you force fed him targets, he would deliver. He he is dominant at every level, but they don't do that, so it makes it hard to trust. Hopkins comes in at eight on our consensus rankings. I'm at ten, Jason at eight, Mike at six. Mike, you're the most bullish here. Yeah, obviously the clear alpha in the offense. And we talked about him in the quick question. But last year, lowest re uh, receiving yards per game since his rookie year. There was some frustration about the old route tree or route bush or whatever they <laughs> were using him. That's not changing because Cliff has been extended uh, for infinity. So uh, the all the tumult of, in Arizona, you still have him ranked pretty high. Yeah, he was fantastic to start the season, uh, you know, it was we essentially had like seven weeks before uh he hurt himself in that Green Bay game off of uh some very questionable play calling from his head coach. But in that time period time period I should say <laughs> in that time period, he was the wide receiver ten. Arizona was seven and oh. Like things things were very good when Hopkins was actually healthy and playing for this team. Uh, is AJ Green really uh, a threat here? To the <laughs> let me let me check the tape. No, no, he is not. Uh, maybe Rondell Moore, uh, but I just, Hopkins is so safe. Lock him in for thirty plus percent of the targets and a bunch of touchdowns, and I I think he can pick up where he left off before the injury. Jason, what are the range of outcomes for Hopkins this year? Yeah, I mean the range of outcomes. I I think it's going to be good because I uh, he is so necessary to this offense. So barring injury, he should end up worst case the wide receiver fifteen, best case you know a top five wide receiver because he's one of the few guys that you could say has a realistic chance of fifteen receiving touchdowns. Um, he's the only real good wide receiver proven in their prime on the Cardinals rosters so uh, that's the upside you're on a high pace uh you know high flying offense and you're the clear number one and you're super talented lots of reasons to love Hopkins you could get him at a value because people were disappointed from his injury riddled uh finish to last year but the targets are really upsetting um confusing and they are the red flag they you know he has always been a target hog, and now this last year, he really wasn't at all. I mean, you had games where he played 100% of snaps and had two targets. That two, multiple, multiple games. Uh, his, you know, if was you that take the out, Ramsey game? Was that one of them? Uh, one of them was. I'm looking at uh, Ramsey. I'm looking at Jair. Yeah, I was just curious was, how those, if the Cardinals or Kyler got afraid in those games. Yeah, I, I don't remember the, the specifics of those individual games, but look at the entire game log. Uh, until his last game that he got injured in the entire season, he didn't have a double-digit target game, which is crazy. That's what he should be averaging. Sure. Um, so, you know, if you take out that injury game at the end and you look at the other games he played, nine of them, he was on pace for 96 targets. And that's like, what? Yeah, they did. Cardinals got to figure some things out. Mm -hmm. Tyreek Hill comes in at Oof. well the the final two on our list. Tyreek Hill, Mike Evans are actually tied in our consensus rankings. I have Tyreek at seven, Mike at nine, Jason at ten, and then Mike Evans nine, nine, and eight. You know, different stories here. Tyreek Hill, you've got that whole switching teams narrative, and this one is this one's hard to see going getting better. That's for sure. You don't leave 
Patrick Mahomes and multiple years of chemistry, an elite Hall of Fame quarterback, and improve. That's just not something that's going to happen for Tyreek Hill. Now, you you could have a pretty nice season for Tyreek. I mean, you, you offered – you traded everything to get him, and you have an offense that has retooled itself in a lot of ways. You have Jalen Waddell that's going to demand attention. You have Mike McDaniel who's going to call plays – that are going to be tailored for Tyreek Hill, Tyreek Hill's skill set and what Tua can do. But the question with Tyreek is just simply how far do you drop him? I mean, that's that's the fantasy story, right? How far do you drop Tyreek Hill, and where's that appropriate place to settle him in at? Well, we talked about uh, you know wide receivers moving teams with Devontae Adams, and he moved to a situation where – You've got your best friend and a capable quarterback to get you the ball. Terry Kill's moving to a situation where you've got a hopeful franchise quarterback, maybe, and Tua. They're going to find out this year. Um, but it's it's a much worse situation for Tyree Kill. I would presume that Tua throws fewer touchdowns than Derek Carr. And even though you're, you've got a head coach here that's going to get him the ball in a, in a myriad of ways, screens, handoffs, Tyreek Hill should touch the ball a lot, but he will certainly have a problem when it comes to scoring touchdowns. And, you know, I've got him at 10, and I think that's I, – I can't imagine drafting him over the other people ahead of him. The decision you have to make for Tyreek Hill on Tua is I – mean, we have it's a chicken and egg type of a thing where if you look at the completion percentage on deep attempts, Tua is actually – very strong uh you know when you filter out by uh a 20 percent of the minimum attempts like he's third in completion percentage of deep passes just behind justin herbert and kyler murray now the big difference is seven and a half percent of Tua's targets were deep shots so that which in 13 games was just 29 times that he go down the field and so Those he's the- he's being judicious when he uh, when he wants to take that shot, and he's being successful, but is he being more like is he? Uh, I know less it is inclined to do it because yes. he doesn't have the personnel to do it. What well, part of it is not uh, part of the deep shots for Tyree Kill are unscripted. Patrick Mahomes is spinning in a circle, running outside the pocket, and then Tyree Kill and him have a mind meld. So I think that's the volume aspect of those plays. I'm not concerned about him being able to fade back on a design bomb to Tyree Kill and figure some of those out. I just wonder if you're going to get as many of those unscripted 15 seconds into the play Tyreek's getting the downfield target. Right. You already know the answer to that. The answer is absolutely <laughs> not. Like there's okay. there's no there's no way he's getting as many of those unscripted down the field targets uh, from Tua as he did from Mahomes. Just impossible. Yeah. I agree. I mean, that's why he's not number 2. Uh, Mike Evans, to discuss Mike Evans is to, I mean, we should always play back whatever we said the previous year on Mike Evans, right? <laughs> he's just the he's, same. He's awesome. He just does the same thing. 74 for 1035 and 14 last year. He's going to catch 70 to 80 passes. <laughs> he's going to hit 1,000 Yep, by hook or by crook. Mm-hmm. Thank goodness he got, uh, well, I guess there was a 17-game season, but he only played 16. Um, but he gets into the end zone, and frankly, he's going to he's the he's the one piece of stability for Tom Brady coming into the year. Yep, uh, he, with Tom Brady, he's had over a thousand yards each of those years. He's had at least thirteen receiving touchdowns and been a top ten wide receiver in that time. Uh, Mike Evans has been a wide receiver one now for four straight years, and the worst the worst career finish for Mike Evans was wide receiver twenty four. Guy is just an absolute machine, and he's he's actually pulled his hamstring in every game oh, he's yeah. ever played. Oh yeah, he's never not pulled his hamstring at some point during the game. Isn't that right, Kyle? Can you confirm that? Get That's my, correct. Get my man confirmed. a foam roller. All right, Ky- Kyle confirmed. <laughs> get that man. Um, he's the only person, Jason, with worse hamstrings than you. Oh man, <laughs> we found one. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's more like. Uh, Ho hum, Mike Evans is great. No one really seeks. Nobody sets out in their draft to draft Mike Evans. I don't know why that is. 
Because Nobody he can't st- finish as the number one wide receiver. He what? Like we, we, because he can't finish as the no, number one can't. wide receiver. You're right. He yeah, can't. So you're always trying to – you're saying, oh, all these guys are great. I'm going to take the shot at a big breakout season from uh, A.J. Brown. And it's like – or – or you could just take the guarantee of a really good season for Mike Evans and and concede that you're not going to have the number one wide receiver, but that you've got a bona fide star fantasy option. It's, I, it's crazy, and there's name fatigue, is there not? Oh, for sure. He's yeah. he is. You're so fatigued from the Mike Evans conversations every single year. Uh, and it's great. Well, all that means is he's going to be a value again in drafts. He's going to be drafted slightly below where he finishes. He'll be a worthy draft pick, and you should do that. You should take him where he's landing in, in ADP come draft season. I'll just call him Evan Michaels from here on out to try to spice his oh, productivity okay. up. Okay, a little, little sneaky sneak. Uh, he does bust from time to time, just decides to disappear <laughs> for an entire game. Um, but he's just... Deserves he's, respect. He's a team guy. You know, like sometimes. Really? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes he just. That's is, a key to being a team guy, disappearing? Yeah, because he's saying someone else can Ru- carry the uh, the the mantle. In like this. Russell Gage. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Like at least three times this, this season, Russell Gage will be a top guy. So because when all the wide receivers disappeared in Atlanta, Russell Gage stepped up. He did. Mm. Okay. So is Russell Gage getting a little selfish? Mm. Not really a team guy. He's kind of tr- trying to be like. Give me the ball. Russell I Gage is just happy to be there. <laughs> <laughs> he gets paid money to go play with Tom Brady, and when he signed the deal, was Brady retired? Uh, I don't oh, that's rem- a good question. I don't remember. I don't remember the timing. No, Brady called him. Did he? Yeah, Gage thought it was a prank call. <laughs> oh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> that's a true story? That's a true story. Wow. That's a nice phone call to get. So wait. You're telling me that so Brady that, recruited. I'm all in. So last like two weeks ago, Tom Brady actually called me. No, that was definitely not him. No, <laughs> dang it. That I don't know what to believe about any of the Brady rumors. Oh With man, all the Miami there's, stuff. There's some juicy stuff. I mean, stuff. crazy. Does he go up to a magical lair and start <laughs> conniving and figuring out master plans? <laughs> what was it? The rumor that he and I. I know I'll get some of the story wrong, but. That he basically was going to take it a, a, a high office position. Yes, he was going to take a so front office com- position in com- Miami and then get complete tabloid stuff. But what some uh, journalists, their line of thinking was, he was already he was meeting with the ownership for Miami, was going to take an executive level job, retire. Wink. Then unretire, but already have the because the rules of the NFL are he could take the executive job. For another team, while he's still his player contract is for another team, force the trade, and now, now he's playing in Miami. And part of that was getting Sean Payton. Yes. To oh yeah, coach. I forgot that part yeah, too. But Sean Payton was going to be the head coach, uh, but then everything happened with the Flores lawsuit, and that oh, it was mad. The- Russell Gage. <laughs> for a minute, I thought it was a prank. Somebody was trying to pull one over on me. I mean, that's. That's wild. That's a fun phone call. Gage, who has admired Brady his entire career, was excited to receive the phone call <laughs> from the seven-time Super Bowl champion. That's oh, that's some good writing right there. Oh man, what what insight! Gage really admired uh, his quarterbacking <laughs> ability. Wow. Russell Gage, not really sure on this Tom Brady character. Uh, <laughs> said okay fine i mean doesn't it speak to you though that d- if that's true if brady called russell gage then he desires Certainly to integrate helps. him into the offense yeah i mean brady is not wanting to come back and fail brady wants to come back throw for 40 touchdowns try to win a super bowl and he did realizes, i say brady bust yeah i was gonna <laughs> was say that me i did that you what, tried that like a few a years ago, ago. And it was I, like 10 I, years ago, the beginning of the end. <laughs> yeah. No, it's never happening. Too much witchcraft. Well, uh, that'll do it for today's episode of the show. We do have a very exciting announcement for you on the Ooh. Thursday episode of the show, so stay tuned for that. You can find us also on social media, in case we tease it a little sooner, Twitter, at the FF Ballers. You can check us out there. You can find us on Instagram, instagram.com slash fantasyfootballers. You can watch the show on YouTube at youtube.com slash the 
fantasy footballers. Make sure you subscribe, click the bell, because we will be doing some draft-related stuff that you'll want to know about on top of uh, some exciting announcements coming up. So that'll do it. We'll get into some of the more difficult names at the wide receiver position on Thursday with our early wide receiver rankings episode part two. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.